My name's Jay Davis. Um, I'm a father of five children. I'm married to my beautiful wife, Rhonda, for almost 19 years now. And um, we are fortunate enough to um, be here today after a tragic illness that almost took my life. We're a blended family, three boys from Jay and a boy and a girl from me. We happen to take our children to the same daycare, and um, that's where we met. From there, he um, asked me out, and we got married a year and a half later, and now we are one big <laughs> family. If there's such a term, Jay and I were probably weekend Christians. We attended church every Sunday with our children, and we were at Faith Bridge at least six years and, you know, kind of sat in the back row. We would play like we were Christian, but we weren't really, we weren't plugged in, we weren't in community. You know, we have to take care of our souls and there's, there's ways to do that. And we had separated from that uh, totally. So Mr. Davis had a condition we call idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's a progressive scarring of the small airways within the lungs. So um, there's, it's usually a, a pretty slow deterioration. I kind of beat the odds. Usually it's a five-year death sentence when they tell you you have it, but um, I fought through it and I kept it to myself. Rhonda knew, but I didn't let on that it was a big deal. I guess because he seemed okay and normal and doing sports with the kids and, you know, we were water skiing on the weekends and I didn't think much of it. It's an odd disease in that, um, you know, a lot of patients, and in Mr. Davis it happened as well, there sometimes is a trigger and then something happens that kind of accelerates this process and they get real sick very quickly. By 2014, it was a downhill slide pretty quickly. When you can't breathe and you don't have enough oxygen, it's it's pretty scary feeling. You're thinking about, you know, this could be my time, and um, I wasn't ready. With IPF, the um, there are no drugs. There's no cure for it. Um, it's only a lung transplant. I went to the transplant center and started doing the preliminary testing to qualify to receive a lung transplant. The uh, last day was to check his heart and they found out that he had blockage. So before they would do anything about the lungs, they had to do a triple bypass. So that led us to the walking into the, the surgery in March uh, to get heart surgery and then things fell apart from there. After the triple bypass, he never, his lungs completely shut down. And that's when he had to go on life support. He went, he went into the heart bypass part of it with severely restricted lung function. Um, and then again, when they then got worse, you know, that was the end of the road. There was a room off of the ICU waiting room and it was almost like the principal's office, like you didn't want to be called into that room because you saw families being called in and it, it wasn't good. And so they called our whole family in there and uh, told us that there probably wasn't much that we could do. On the outside, I was strong, but at night, I would go in our bedroom closet and I would lay on the floor in the fetal position and I would just cry and scream because I didn't want any of the kids to know how scared I was. But I just, I would beg, dear God, please, please. Then I had a 
uh, ICU nurse that would come in and uh, she would pray over me and she would sing to me. I recall her telling me all the time, just don't worry, hang on to the hand of Jesus. And she came one day and she was singing and she said, I know it's bad, but don't worry, hang on to the hand of Jesus. And I saw him that morning and I just saw something in his eyes. I knew that he wouldn't make it through the week. And I cried and cried and cried because I didn't, I didn't want to lose him. So I chose to go and sit out in the praying garden. I begged God, you know, we fought for so long and so hard. Please don't make it all for nothing. And if not, please get him out of us, you know, just take him, let him come be with you so he isn't suffering anymore. But I recall laying there in the bed, being helpless and telling God, I surrender. It's up to you. I can't do it by myself. As hard as it was, I'd let go and I said, he's yours. I surrendered him to God. I saw a hand come to me and I grabbed it. And a feeling of peace and assurance came over me that it was gonna be okay. No matter what happened, I didn't feel like, okay, I'm, I'm cured, but I felt like no matter what happened, it was okay. And I went back upstairs to sit in ICU, and um, I sat down, and not one second later, my cell phone rang. <laughs> I am Misty Estrada, and Merlin Quiles was my little brother. He was a staff sergeant, combat engineer in the Army. He deployed to Afghanistan three times. He got a Purple Heart, a Bronze Star. He um, was a Ranger. My point of reference was always him. That was just who he was, like inherently good and kind. We talked every day. I whether it be text message or phone call, we talked every day. He told me that he was gonna be an organ donor. He's like, I wanna give somebody else the chance to finish out their life. You know, if I can't finish mine, then let them finish out their life and let me help them do that. I guess a car, the car didn't see him and hit him at an intersection. They called me and they said, Missy, they're declaring him brain dead. I said, no, he's not. Stop saying that. Get them to track him again. They said his organs are going to die. He's not there anymore, he's gone. Merlin wanted his organs, he wanted to help. Finally, hours later, I stopped fighting. So they were just disconnecting him and, and about to move him out. And as they did, all of his friends like lined the hallways and saluted him as he passed into the OR. I kept thinking, this can't be real. My cell phone rang, and it was the um, transplant coordinator to tell me that there were lungs available for Jay. My first re recollection of having lungs was when Rhonda was right in my face, basically. <laughs> And she was crying and she said, you have lungs. You have lungs. At first, I couldn't speak and I couldn't, I couldn't even point to letters on a chart. And I recall the first time that physical therapy worked with me. They would come in and ask me, what are my goals? And when I finally was able to, my answer to what was my goal was dance, wedding. 
I spelled it out with my finger. My goal was to dance at my daughter's wedding. And in December of 15, she walked down the aisle and I was, she was on my arm. We did a little dance at the wedding. It makes me appreciate every day and every little experience that I get to have with my family and my kids and my community that um, they're gifts. Every day is a gift. When I came home from the hospital, and I, I mean literally within two or three days of coming home, I fired off a, what I call a nasty gram to, to Ken <laughs> and, and kind of lit in, you know, hey, I don't recall but one person coming to see me at the hospital, and that was Terry Teekel, and no one's been to my home, and no one came when I was in rehab, and probably in a little bit of anger, I said it. And it wasn't long after that, um, Ron and I started coming back to church. I was finally able to walk with a cane, and it kind of dawned on me <laughs> that it was my own fault that I wasn't plugged into community, and that's why people didn't know. I had listened to Ken say a thousand times how important community was, and I ignored it. But I know now how important it truly is. We both knew that it was time to get plugged in and for us to give back because we had been given so much. And we decided, you know what, it's time to do Faith Bridge 101. And we did, and we got plugged into a small group. I can't imagine not having those people a part of our lives now. I mean, they're, they're just, they're a part of our lives. And I love it. I'm working with a, with a program called Missional Baseball. I've been doing that. I signed up for the care and giving ministry where we visit hospitals. I felt like it was important for me to get involved in that because I can share with people that are in some pretty bad places that there is hope. Right after we did the Faith Bridge 101, uh, it was my one year anniversary of my transplant. And I decided to get baptized. So it was really special, not only, you know, being reborn, but also doing it right around that, that time. Losing Merlin changed something in me. It broke something in me. It was a, a different, a deeper kind of loss. That this can't be real feeling lasted really until I met Jay. Meeting his family was so bittersweet. It was, it's hard to explain the emotion, the feeling that I had. It was like they were, you know, loved ones already. I saw my brother in him, seeing that uh, kind of gave me a peace I didn't have up until then. Merlin was not only my donor, he also donated two kidneys um, and a liver, and then my set of lungs. to finally be at peace with his death. It hurts still. I don't think that's ever gonna stop. <laughs> but like this is what Merlin meant when he said he wanted to give somebody the chance to finish out their life. And without him, you know, I don't believe our faith life would be where it is now. We're eternally grateful to that family and to Merlin for all that they have given us. I mean, they literally have given us a second chance at life. There's a reason for me to be here, and I don't know exactly what that is. Maybe it's little things, maybe it'll be a big thing. I don't know, uh, but all I know is, is that I'm thankful that I'm here 
and I'm here because he wants me here. And if he wants me here, I need to do his work.